The following program contains graphic images. Viewer discretion is advised. It's the week of March 20th, 1995. The average high temperature in Los Angeles is 66 degrees. Nike stocks rise when Michael Jordan announces he's returning to the Chicago Bulls. The overall stock market hovers around the 2700 mark. Across the U.S., new area codes are announced as phone companies struggle to keep up with the surge in new customers. Gas at the pump is $1.07 a gallon. Microsoft teams up with new movie studio DreamWorks, which will go on to produce films like Saving Private Ryan, Gladiator, and Castaway. Meanwhile, 50 million viewers are riveted to what's happening in a courtroom in Los Angeles as they watch the trial of the century. But for the families of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown, it is simply a quest for justice as they continue to mourn the murder of their loved ones. Week nine of The People versus O.J. Simpson opens with the prosecution doing damage control following Detective Mark Furman's testimony. Still on the defensive, the prosecution tries to regain momentum with a house guest of O.J.'s who was there the night of the murders and heard something outside his room. I'm Roger Cossack, and this is OJ 25. Yes, Your Honor, will be Detective Philip Van Adder. Right. My name is Philip Van Adder. We were assuming the responsibility of a double homicide at 875 South Bundy, and that one of the victims was believed to be Nicole Brown Simpson. I take it that you consider this a serious situation, that is the fact that there were two, uh, two dead people on Bundy. Well, I consider any homicide call that I go on a serious situation, yes. Okay, well, the fact that it involved uh, Nicole Brown Simpson, did that make the situation seem any more urgent or important in your mind? Uh, the, the only thing that uh, that, that triggered in my mind that uh, knowing that, that there was a connection to Mr. Simpson, that there would probably be a lot of media, yes. Did you think in your mind that perhaps you should investigate the case differently than you would any other murder case? No, sir. Every homicide case is important. He cared, and I think that's what really stood out about Phil. When you approach a crime scene, are you careful not to step on things? Yes. And why is that? Well, can I relate it to this crime scene? OK. Uh, this was a very, very bloody crime scene. Um, you don't want to contaminate the area. The area has been secured. So you're very careful and you pick your, you pick your route very carefully. Did you ever see two gloves at this location? Not at Bundy, no. Okay. Did any officer ever tell you that he or she saw two gloves at that location? No. Now, as you approach the, the bodies, did you see any bloody footprints on the, on the landing? Actually, I saw the first prints they were pointed out to me on the uh, landing, and then I observed what appeared to be molded prints on the steps coming up, as well as between the two victims. The blood will tell us who the suspect is. This is a case about blood, always has been. Did you see anything else of interest to you as a homicide investigator near those bloody shoe prints? I saw five blood drops that led from the area of the bodies along the left side of the shoe prints, out to the end of the uh, walkway, out on the apron of the driveway. What was the significance that you attached to these blood drops, if any? Well, they appeared to be not associated with the crime scene itself. It appeared to me that the bloody shoe prints were being left by the suspect as he was exiting west, and that he was either bleeding himself or was carrying an object to his left that was, that was dripping blood. Another major concern initially was uh, the footwear impressions and the fact that the blood droplets tailed in the same direction. So we know that the blood droplets came from the left side, whoever left those footwear impressions. And did you see any uh, blood drops outside the rear gate? 
Yes, there was one on the apron of the driveway just northwest of the rear end of the, the vehicle there. Did you see any drops of blood on the asphalt in the alley? No, I did not. Did you see any bloody shoe prints in the alley? No. This fact, the fact that you saw no blood in the, on the asphalt in the alley, what significance, if any, did you attach to, to that observation? That indicated to me that most likely a suspect had entered some mode of transportation, possibly a vehicle, at that point and had uh, left the scene. Is why there were no, no further uh, blood drops. There was one blood droplet back by the gate where a car would be parked. It's completely round, centric. It means that the source was not moving at all. It wasn't tailing in any direction. If a blood drop is tailing when it hits, it'll spread out. And this one wasn't. That means whoever was left the blood has stopped. There's a coin, a couple of coins there by this blood drop. That tells me that whoever it was stopped. Maybe they're going for their keys. Pull the keys out, and maybe they dropped a couple of coins where this blood droplet was, and then they left. That was the last blood droplet in this series. I believe there were like six of them. What happened next, Detective? I had been earlier told that there were two minor children in custody, and my concern was to make a notification, make a disposition for the children to get them out of the police station, to meet Mr. Simpson, realizing that at some point I was going, myself or my partner was going to have to interview him. So we made a decision to make a, a notification at that time. Now, Mr. Simpson was Miss Brown's ex-husband, was right? That's correct. So does he qualify as an ex of Kim? Not to the victim, but uh, uh, not to the female victim. However, again, we had two small children in custody that he was the father of that we needed to make a disposition on. So I thought it appropriate that uh, he be notified. I didn't know who the suspect was. Any, anybody could have been the suspect at that point. Did you dislike Mr. Simpson for any reason? <laughs> no, I didn't know him. I thought he was a great football player. <laughs> At some point, you, you arrived at uh, 360 North Rockingham? That's correct. And you said it took, what, approximately five minutes to drive there? Yes. You said you walked toward the Bronco? That's correct, to get a perspective of the home and the uh, area to see if there was a way I could get to the front door from, from the Rockingham gate. Okay. Who reached the Bronco first? You were Detective Furman? Detective Furman. And was he in your view at all times? Yes. Lon Cryer is juror number six in the Simpson trial. He takes detailed notes and keeps a personal journal during the trial, over 600 pages in all. Says he could see Detective Furman at all times. After walking away back toward Ashford, Furman called him back to Bronco to point out that blood-like spots above door handle on driver's side door of Bronco. And did you view a spot on the Bronco? He pointed out a spot above the driver's door handle that uh, appeared to be a reddish brownish type stain that looked like blood to me. It's not just that we have this man that's related indirectly to possibly one of the victims. It's that somebody left the Bundy scene with blood on their shoes and bleeding from the left side of their body. Now we have a car that has little specks of evidence of blood outside on the door handle. He's bleeding from the left side of his body. And the door sill, he's got blood on his shoes. A reasonable man would conclude that there is a, a possibility that, that the Bundy scene is connected now to Rockingham, and that could be in a life-saving situation or a suspect situation. I told Detective Furman that with the information I had, I was very concerned regarding the occupants of the home, that something could be wrong. We went to the Ashford Gate. My partner and I discussed it, and we made a decision that we needed to go in and find out if everything was OK. Detective Furman didn't attempt to convince you of the need to, to enter the property? 
Detective Furman could not convince me of anything. No, I was, I was concerned. And so to be clear, the information you had at that time that caused you to be concerned was the lack of any response from a living maid? The lack of any response from anybody. Okay. The lights on inside the house? That's correct. The fact that there were cars in the driveway? Vehicles in the driveway. You just left a bloody homicide scene? Extremely bloody homicide scene. There seemed to be blood on the door of the Bronco? That's correct. And you had some inclination that the Bronco was owned by Mr. Simpson? Yes. Okay. Had you ever met Mr. Simpson prior to that morning? No. For that day, rather? No. What was the conversation you had with Detective Furman at that time? Detective Furman uh, asked me to accompany him to the south side of the residence. He, he wanted to show me something. And he took me down the south boundary line of the property. This is the item that was pointed out to me by uh, Detective Furman, which is a right-hand brown man's leather glove. I felt the glove evidence was very, very significant, and for this reason. The glove evidence in and of itself dispelled any notion of conspiracy. The uh, unique nature of the gloves, heiress, light gloves, size extra large, uh, a type of glove which per our expert was in very limited production, and the fact that we had the left-hand glove found at the Bundy crime scene and a blood-saturated right-hand glove found beneath the air conditioning platform at Simpson's Rockingham house, I felt was very key evidence. What did you ask him to do? I asked him to go back to the Bundy location to look at the other glove and to uh, make sure that I was seeing what I was seeing. Well, we believed at that point that the, that the uh, probability of what had been found, that we had an extension from the Bundy crime scene. What, if anything, did you do after Detective Lang left? I was in the driveway of the residence, and I started looking around. And in the vicinity of one of the vehicles parked in the Rockingham driveway, I observed what appeared to me to be a blood spot on the ground. It immediately made me think that I'd picked up the blood trail again from Bundy. What did you do at that point? What, if anything, Detective? I walked west in the driveway, concentrating on looking at the driveway to see if I could find any other blood drops, or what appeared to be blood drops. And I did. I found approximately three or four more drops between the rear end of the Bronco and the first one that I had discovered. What appeared to be a Another blood trail. I walked to the Bronco to have a closer look at the Bronco to see if there was any other blood I could see there. I looked in from the passenger side of the vehicle and I observed what appeared to be a blood smear along the passenger side of the console and what appeared to be blood on the inside of the driver's door of the vehicle. The more powerful circumstance is the bloody shoe prints that leave the Bundy scene with somebody bleeding from the left side of their body to now you have blood on a Bronco and blood inside a Bronco that's outside of the Rockingham Estate and a blood trail leading into the Rockingham Estate. I followed it to the front door. At that point, other detectives were there and pointed out blood spots right in the foyer of the home to me. And these blood drops are located Inside the foyer at Mr. Simpson's home? Inside the front door, yes, sir. Did you continue to search that area for other blood drops? Not at that point, no. After your first walk through at Bundy, was he a suspect? No. And when you first arrived at Rockingham, was he a suspect? No. During the time that you were ringing the buzzer in front of the property, was he a suspect then? No. And when you rang the front door at Rockingham, was he a suspect then? No. At some point in time, did you consider him a suspect? Absolutely. Where was Mr. Simpson the first time you saw him? Walking across the driveway in the front of the residence. He was handcuffed. I explained the reason I was there, what was happening. Why did you take the cuffs off, Mr. Simpson? 
Because he was not under arrest at that time. But you considered him a suspect, is that correct? He was a very strong suspect. I had asked him voluntarily to accompany me to Parker Center for an interview. He agreed to that. He was not under arrest at that point. Did you see the defendant's hand? Yes. Did you notice anything unusual? Yes. And what did you notice? That he had a bandage on the middle finger of his left hand on the upper knuckle of the middle finger. What significance did you attach to that injury? Well, going back to the original crime scene at Bundy, would appear that uh, that he had the injury that was uh, that would have caused those blood drops on the left side of the bloody footprints. Hard to cut yourself in Chicago when it's bleeding on the airplane. So we know that somebody actually applied first aid to themselves in the house sometime the previous night. So could have been before he left for Chicago. Could have been a reasonable explanation. He is the one that made himself a suspect. Was there a cut on the defendant's hand when you first saw him? Yes. I believe during the struggle, the left-hand glove was lost and dropped on the ground. And uh, that's when the cut occurred, when the hands were not protected. We knew that uh, obviously it was obvious the, the way Ron Goldman was lying and his wounds, there was a hell of a struggle. I mean, they were going around on the ground. There's blood everywhere. Uh, no doubt lost the glove in the struggle. What if his finger uh, was always swollen due to uh, a medical condition and not due to any laceration? Would that concern you? I guess that could be a possibility. However, it appeared to be swollen from the laceration that right. morning. Your Honor, before I proceed with further questions, may uh, Mr. Simpson show his finger to the jury before we do further examination. Thank you. Mr. Simpson. On visual examination of finger this morning, same previously injured finger still appears to be swollen. And as he got closer to where I was sitting, I heard him mumble, I want him to take a good look at it. I was bothered because I'm like, why, why is he targeting me? Uh, and then I started thinking, does he think I'm a positive uh, uh, juror for his case? Would you describe the finger of Mr. Simpson today as being swollen? It didn't appear swollen to me, no. That's evidence. When you get an MT, a medical treatment on a cut finger, you get photographs of the finger on the left side. That's pretty damning evidence, OK? Because we got the blood at the scene on the left side. Is it your opinion that the person who did the killing was bleeding at the time he came or she came to Rockingham? Yes. I take it then there was a thorough search for blood from the area of Rockingham to the area where the glove was found. Yes, that's correct. How much blood was found there? None. None that I'm aware of. I thought uh, Simpson's interview uh, by Tom Lang and Phil Van Adder uh, was woefully short. This was a, a golden opportunity that uh, wasn't fully exploited. This was an opportunity to stretch Simpson out, to establish details, to uh, depose him in effect, and obtain a very, very complete statement. He was as cooperative as anybody could be, wasn't he? If being truthful is being cooperative, then uh, that's very subjective. I'm not sure that uh, his demeanor was cooperative, but I don't believe the information was truthful. Did he do everything you asked of him? Yes. It took about two minutes into that interview to realize that this was more than a narcissist, that this was a sociopath who's used to being in charge. He would be in charge here. He's already dismissed two of his lawyers. They said they were going to lunch. Not that surprised because he was going to control everything. Now, most people said it was an interrogation. No, they're two completely different things. So you let him talk on. You want inconsistencies in any interview. You don't become accusatory. You just say, well, tell us about this or that. If you, he wants to take this interview over, let him. In 33 minutes, I think we got three different stories on how he cut his hand. Did you take a sample of, uh, of the defendant's blood that afternoon? He signed and agreed to give the blood sample. The nurse took a syringe from his equipment and drew a sample of blood. 
Doesn't LAPD policy require blood samples to be booked immediately? As soon as practical, yes. Does it say immediately or as soon as practical? Well, immediate, immediately to me means as soon as practical. Well, I know what it means to you, but I'm saying what does the policy say without your interpretation? As soon as possible. It says as soon as possible, that's yes. what the manual says? Yes. Are you sure of that? Well, it's, it says immediately or I, let me withdraw that. It says immediately is what it says. I think me, Phil me, me, got me. worn down by the, the media scrutiny, the attention, and just the, the sheer intensity and longevity of the case. I think it was very hard on him. As soon as can be done was when you had it in your hand to walk down and in the same building you were in, turn it over to the evidence room and have it uh, marked and booked and properly refrigerated, right? That couldn't be done at that point. Why not? Because other evidence had been gathered. Uh, evidence has to be booked in a sequence. I didn't know what number the blood would be in the sequence. What type of security uh, did you use for that blood vial? I placed it in a manila envelope, maintained control of it, and hand-delivered it to the criminalist. Where was the criminalist? At Rockingham. Or wasn't there a risk of something happening to the blood and transporting at that distance? No, the risk was me not keeping control of the blood, uh, the chain of custody of the blood to give it to the criminalist. That was the risk. I take it that if you walked it from uh, where you were in Parker Center right up to the evidence room, uh, there'd be much less risk. I drove straight to Rockingham, checked in, and immediately gave the blood to the criminalist who had finished his work and was leaving. How many times have you taken blood from Parker Center out to a crime scene. I don't know, this may have been the first time. I don't know. He brought blood to the crime scene of Simpson after the interrogation, and so all the blood in the driveway, any drops of blood in the house, everything was compromised in some way, once again by Ben Adder. Give you the testimony, make it the now pending before this court. We'll give you two Mrs. Robertson, is the water fresh? Water's fresh. There was something about him, his haircut, the name Cato. It, it was ridiculous, because that's not his real name. Cato was a character from a TV show from the, from the 60s, um, The Green Hornet. I think Cato Kalin was one of the more memorable witnesses. I really do. Did you have a conversation with the defendant? Yes. Tell us what the nature of that conversation was. He asked me if I had some cash. I gave him the money, and he said he was going to get hamburger, and I said, can I go? You invited yourself to go with him? Yes. And what was his response to that? Sure. You seem real excited to have you come? Objection. Sustain. Wouldn't you? His name. <laughs> <laughs> it's week nine. The testimony of O.J. Simpson's house guest, Kato Kalin, continues as he recalls the night of the murders, the night he was in his room on Simpson's estate. For millions of TV viewers, Kalen's long hair and surfer boy persona creates followers, known by some as Cato groupies. Approximately what time was it when you got your food? 9.25, 9.26. Did you say anything to him? No. What did you do? I looked and said, oh, I'll eat in my room. Did he make any response to you when you said, I'll eat in my room? Oh, no, that was in my mind, I'll eat in my room. You didn't say that out No, no, in my head I was going, I'll eat in my room. Okay. Sorry. After we got back, 9.40, 9.45. The state's timeline was that O.J. Simpson was last seen around 
9.40 or something when he returned from going to McDonald's with Kato Kalin. They then put the time of the murders at about 10.15. How long was that made after you saw the defendant standing at his car? I pretty quickly, because I was eating my food, I think, on the phone, so right after. Right after, I, yeah, within a minute, minute or two. During that phone call, sir, did something unusual occur? Yes. And what was that? I, I heard a thumping noise. How many thumps did you hear? Objection. Reading. Overruled. Sorry. Yes. Three. Can you demonstrate for us how loud it was? Somewhat, yes. Go ahead. Here. Yeah, go ahead. And where did that noise seem to be coming from? From the back of the wall. From behind you, where from, you were sitting? Right, from behind the wall, from where I was sitting. And so approximately what time was it when you heard the thumps on the wall? At about 10.40. Cato Kalin was able to establish a timeline where he heard a thump on the back wall of the guest house that he shared at O.J. Simpson's house, and that would put a time to when O.J. Simpson presumably hopped the fence and, and hit the air conditioner on his way back to his house. So that's a critical witness because you needed to place O.J. Simpson at a specific place and at a specific time. And I think that, I think that Cato Kalin did that. You saw the limousine parked at the Ashford gate. Yes, I did. You did not let the limo driver in. What, where did you go? What did you do? I checked on the, the noise. Okay, as far as you got on, this, on that south pathway, sir, were you able to see the area, uh, the ground area around the air conditioner in your room? And it, why did you stop on the pathway where you did? Just did. I couldn't see, I was, I just stopped. Why? You know, I was scared, but oh, that's it. You were scared? Yeah. We saw a lot of Cato Kalins uh, when I was growing up. They're sort of, you know, beach boys who never quite become beach men. And that's exactly what Cato Kalin was. I just think that he came across as so flaky that people had a tough time taking what he said seriously. He really became, other than a remembered character, really a, a non uh, part of this trial. Where did you go then? I went back out. <laughs> okay. And. The limo was still there. I thought, maybe I should let this guy in. So I went to the gate control box. It's a button. I don't know if I, what I remember about, if I mentioned about oversleeping or not, I said, did OJ oversleep or if he said it, that he overslept, but that came up. And I said, oh, he's got a flight to catch. I said, OJ, I heard this noise and uh, I thought it was an earthquake and I thought maybe someone's back there and I told him I was gonna investigate it and I had a lousy flashlight. What happened next? Yeah, uh, he noticed the time and had to catch the flight. What did he say? Is that the time? I said, you gotta catch your flight. What happened next? Uh, he got in the limo to catch the flight. Approximately what time was it when he did that? I, I thought it was like 11.15. Can you, sir, estimate for us about how much time you spent with the defendant after the limo driver arrived? I think it was about five minutes. OG thought Cato was an idiot. Every time Cato told his story, he got, it got a little more embellished, a little more embellished, a little more. If Cato had told his story many more times, he would have been there and have been a witness to the murder. Now, at some point, were you awakened? Yes. By what? Uh, there was a knocking, at, banging at the door. Mm -hmm. And who was at the door? Uh, four detectives. Where did he take you? I followed through into the main house. Okay. Who did you follow? I believe Arnell was leading with Key and the rest of the detectives. All right, while you were seated at the bar area with Phil, uh, towards the end of that conversation, did something occur that drew your attention? Oh, yes. And what was that? Um, Arnell had uh, like screamed. 
<laughs> what did she scream? She said, oh my God. So you heard her scream, oh my God. And then what happened? And I was sitting there and I knew something was very wrong. And I believe the detective finished the interview with me and uh, he had told me what had happened. Okay. And what did he tell you? That um, Nicole was murdered. You consider yourself the defendant's friend, don't you, Mr. Kalin? I, yes. I'm still a friend. I know my job is to be 100% honest, and that's what I'm going to do. Cato? You believe him? Who knows? I mean, we're talking about witnesses here who had so many motivations other than finding truth that you have to look beyond the words of Cato, Furman, Van Adder. That's why the forensics was so important. You a little bit nervous today? Feel great. <laughs> a little nervous. Can you tell us uh, whether you had a discussion with her about that guest house in the rear? I did. What was I, the nature of it, of your discussion? I, I said, Nicole, I, who lives back there? And she said, no one. And then I said, could I? Now, did you ever move into that townhouse, sir? No. Why not? I was going to move in, and I moved in at OJ's. Why not? Why'd you do that? Uh, because OJ asked me to go to his house. Did he um, indicate anything to you with respect to what he thought of the fact that you'd be living in the same house with Nicole Brown? Well, they were trying to work things out, and I said that I understood. It wasn't, uh, I thought maybe I shouldn't be a guy in the house and I would go there. Did you uh, think that your friendship with him, your acquaintanceship, especially living on his property, might send acting roles your way? I don't think we're going for the same parts. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't. <laughs> In mid to late May, did the defendant ask you to start looking for a place to live? Did he ask me to look? No. Did he indicate anything to you with respect to his relationship with Nicole? Uh, their relationship was over. Do you recall how that happened to come up? How come you were talking about him and Nicole being through? I think it just came up um, about, uh, he was going to recital. I think it had to do with Paula. Who do you mean when you talk about Paula? Who's that? O.J.'s girlfriend. They were divorced. They had been divorced. And O.J. had plenty of women. I mean, there were plenty of women knocking at O.J.'s door. You know, we're talking about Polly, beautiful woman. You know, she's, you know, you know, she's there for O.J. Um, there's a lot of other beautiful women there for O.J. And O.J. had told us, he said, it's over. When the defendant came back from the recital on June the 12th after seeing Nicole, what was his demeanor? He was uh, upset about not being able to see Sydney, and he mentioned the comment about the outfits. Nicole and OJ clearly loved each other, and there was there was there was just this constant bickering, and they couldn't be together. I don't get the sense that O.J. Simpson ever wanted to let her go, and I think that she lived a great deal of her life in fear. What was the defendant's physical demeanor, his physical body movements when he talked to you about Nicole wearing tight dresses? Answer. You can answer the question. Oh, that he was upset he made a point to say the tight dresses that I mentioned before. Did you see him that, clench his fist or his teeth? I didn't, I didn't see like that clenching his, his fist or his teeth. He was upset. I think he viewed Nicole as a possession, no different than his golf clubs or his cars or his house, but Nicole is a possession, and she was supposed to be where he wanted her and doing what he wanted. But 
he wouldn't allow her to have a personal life. So if it's going to be domestic, it's the switch over from control and jealousy, the, the old thing, if I can't have you, nobody will. At the point that you moved out to Rockingham, you had already made plans to go and live with Nicole at Bundy, is that right? Yes. What was her reaction to that? When I was going to Bundy? When you changed your mind, oh, she instead was of moving in with her and you went to Rockingham. She's upset. She felt you betrayed her, didn't she? No. She felt I was manipulated, it was her words. Did the defendant tell you he did not want you to move in with Nicole at Bundy? It wasn't those words, but it was the, it was basically not a right thing to do. And why did he tell you it was not the right thing to do? Um, he just said uh, that uh, trying to work things out is probably not right to be in the same house. In the same, not a guest house, but in the house. Did he tell you he was afraid that you were going to have sex with Nicole? No. Mr. Kalen, did he convey to you the feeling that he was worried about his wife's security in terms of being uh, assaulted by you? No. That you were going to steal from her? No. That you were going to beat her children? No. No. Of no. What was the concern that he conveyed to you about your staying in the same place with her at Bundy? Well, I mean, it could be that, but I'm, I'm telling you that he didn't say I was going to have that. I'm just telling you the truth. And it was the feeling that maybe he, it could be thought that, that maybe I should go, that it, maybe he was thinking maybe... Cato could be with Nicole, but I don't know. It never happened. I so, do believe that the prosecution were putting words in this man's mouth. It just seemed to me like he was being coerced into saying things that would make their case better. But I don't think that he securely believed in some of the things that he actually was saying himself. What did you take that to mean, Mr. Kalen? That it could possibly have been that he was thinking that I might be with Nicole. Sexually? Possibly that he was thinking that, yes. What else would you think as a result of that statement? Well, because I never did. I so understand. I didn't think Mr. that. Mr. Kalen, answer my question. Okay. What well, else would you have thought? Well, that it could, that it could have been that. Hold on. Hold on. There's going to be an objection. It appears that. What's the grounds? Cross examine the improper question. Oh, well, that it possibly could have been that. Having a romance with her. I mean, it could have been, that could have been in his mind. Yes. And I'm asking you if you got the impression it could have been anything else. What else? No, it couldn't have been anything else. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Kalen. Good morning. How are you feeling today? Better. Better than when? Two days ago. Good. Did you ever see OJ in any way be physical towards Nicole during the entire time you knew Nicole Simpson? No. Did you ever see them raise their voices together at each other? Yes. Would you uh, tell us uh, when, is there any particular incident that stands out in your mind in that regard? There was an incident where Nicole was on the phone with the police, I am, I guess it was the police, and I came in, and they were, there was an argument going on, and I, w I didn't know what it was about. I know his car was parked in front, and so I just waited by the guest house on Gretna Green, and uh, the doors, the French doors at the back were open, and he was screaming at Nicole. Did you ever see any physical contact between the two of them? He didn't hit her. There was no physical contact. He and Nicole had a, a tiff a argument. Uh, he didn't tell me everything. He just said, he did tell me, he says, Nicole got a little aggressive. And the next thing she knew that, um, you know, OJ, you know, had slapped her. Were you present at any other time when OJ and Nicole were screaming at each other? Yes. When was that? It was a, a Christmas party. Okay. And you tell us about that. It was a Christmas party um, at uh, Bruce Jenner's. And um, I had walked in with the family while I walked into the party. And like 15 or 20 minutes in the party, Nicole just said, we're leaving. And then there was an argument going on. Someone that came to the party that was an old boyfriend of Nicole's. And I believe 
The other part of the argument was about flowers that were left for O.J. You indicated uh, to Mr. Shapiro on cross-examination that uh, the defendant was never upset about Nicole dating other men. Do you recall saying that? Yes. Is that what you believe? Is that the truth, Mr. Kalin? Oh. He never let on that he was upset about her dating. And then in Christmas of 1993, you recall that there was an argument that night also? Yes. And who was Joseph Peruli? Uh, an ex-boyfriend. Of Nicole's? Of Nicole's. Did the defendant say something to Nicole? Um, there was something going on, yes. There was a, an argument. And it was, I guess, about him being there. Mm. About Joseph Jos Peruli being Joseph. there? I don't know what his last name, but that might have been it. I didn't know his last name. The defendant, was he angry with Nicole? Yes. Do you recall, now, did you tell me, in response to the question I posed to you before the grand jury, as to whether or not you'd ever seen defendant and Nicole argue or fight? Yes. Do you recall telling, did you tell me that there was a 911 call as a result of that fight? Um, it doesn't say it on there. On redirect examination regarding the line of questioning was leading towards disputing some of Cato's earlier testimony regarding OJ's demeanor. And then I started questioning what his motives were, of course, in that situ situation. He seemed like a very quirky uh, type of uh, witness there. And in, in, in the back of my mind, I also questioned why would you really put him on the stand? When I asked you, did you ever observe them to argue or fight? Did you tell me about the Christmas Eve argument? No, I did not. Can I say something? You can. Um, when this was going on with the grand jury and everything was happening, it was, it was there'd be nothing I would, I'd hide from you. My mind was with everything that I, if I would remember something, I would have told you about a 911 call and all that sort of thing. But it wasn't something I wasn't trying to not tell you. Because I know if it's a 911 call, that it'd be a, a report. So I, there's nothing I, I tried to hide from, from you about any of the fights. There was so much. I had to remember I had so much time, I was in front of all these people. So when it, then I remember more, and that's when we had this meeting, so I would tell you stuff that I remember something else. At this point, Marsha Clark is walking a very fine line with her own witness because they need Cato Kalin. He is the only reason that Mark Furman went to the back of the shed to find the gloves because he heard that thump. Now she's trying to almost impeach him because he doesn't remember something from his grand jury testimony. The problem is if they don't believe Cato Kalin on one thing, they can throw out all of his testimony. Very dangerous. So are you telling us now that you felt intimidated by the grand jury, Mr. Kalin? Uh, I, oh, really? You can ask the question. I don't know if intimidated is the word, but I try to remember everything that I could. Do you remember telling me, uh, Mr. Kalin, that you had thought being in front of the grand jury would be intimidating, but it turned out to be just a bunch of old guys in fishing caps? Yes. But I was... Just, I, yes. Not real intimidating. No, no, I was, but I was looking at you. I was just in a room that I've never been to court. Mm -hmm. The ninth week of the trial is now in the rearview mirror. With Cato Kalin still on the stand, his 15 minutes of fame as a witness is wearing thin for him. Coming up, Marsha Clark goes after her own witness in a stunning turnaround that catches more than a few people off guard. I'm going to ask leave of the court to take this witness as a hostile witness. That was not your testimony before, was it, Mr. Kalin? No. Are you here to tell the truth? Yes. Are you doing your best to tell the truth? Yes. That's next on OJ25. I'm Roger Cossack.